Where's the kaboom? There was supposed to be an earth-shattering kaboom. Marvin the Martian is the soft-spoken, easily frustrated, curious, antagonistic creation of animator Chuck Jones, purely developed to fill a one-off hole in Bugs Bunny's rogues gallery. And with a desire to blow up planet Earth, he is arguably the most dangerous Looney Tunes villain ever. Surprisingly, Marvin only appeared in five shorts during the golden age of animation, tying with Tasmanian Devil as the least used star Looney Tune. Through a series of social movements and pop culture shifts, Marvin managed to become a key character in the Looney Lexicon and an iconic fan favourite star in recent decades. In 2020, Marvin the Martian celebrates 72 years of mischief and to help him celebrate I will trace his entire evolution right from 1948 to now. To do so we will look at his entire history, touching on his few design and personality changes, prevalent across more than seven decades of shorts, series and feature films, as well as looking at world events that led not only to his inception, but to his later popularity. In this edition of Cartoon Evolution. <laughs> Joining the Schlesinger studio in 1933, Chuck Jones quickly climbed the ranks from assistant animator to studio director in the space of only five years. Working under Tex Avery and Robert Clampett, Jones had a hand in animating some of the most groundbreaking early Looney Tunes cartoons, developing a slick and stylistic animation style that so perfectly complemented the madcap and zany screwball cartoons produced by his superiors. When he was assigned his own unit in 1938, Jones's initial style was a far cry from the shorts he'd worked on for other directors. They were more Disney-esque than any of the other works being developed at the studio at the time, focusing on cutesy characters like Sniffles, his very first original. Originally intended to be a new star character, during a period where the team were desperate to find new ones, Sniffles, despite appearing in 13 shorts between 1939 and 1946, became a fairly obscure Looney Tune over time. Jones later inferred his earlier, cuter cartoons were merely experimental, saying, I guess in a way I was exploring a medium to find out what it could do. As Jones continued to do so throughout the 1940s, he spawned various other originals, such as Hubie and Bertie, Henry Hawk, The Three Bears, Pepe Le Pew, and Charlie Dog, each more offbeat and wacky than those before, forming the foundations of Jones's beloved, unique, surrealist style. This period, in fact, is what animation historian Leonard Moulton refers to as the flowering of Jones's career, as he additionally began surrounding himself with a team of talented creatives, including writer Michael Maltese, who was proficient in comedic dialogue. Paired with Jones's growing knack for comedic timing and absurd characters, it was a match made in heaven. Moulton called the visual and verbal humour in their films brilliantly unified, suggesting audiences could watch the cartoon's side and still be entertained. Despite his original stars and his successful one-shot shorts, Jones was perhaps at his best when putting his own spin on characters created by other artists, such as taking the sly, proud and confident Sylvester and turning him into a scaredy cat, and in later decades turning the screwy and zany Daffy Duck into a greedy and obnoxious yet more lovable character. In the early 40s, he had been one of the directors behind the development of Bugs Bunny, working in tandem with Frizz Freeling and Robert McKimson to transition him from hyperactive screwy pest to cool, laid-back, quick-witted trickster. In his shorts, Jones developed a key formula for Bugs in which he would be the victim of his foes instead of the antagonist, giving justification to his often cruel and violent antics by way of self-defense, helping the formation of a more likable character. One of the earliest examples is 1940's Elmer's Candid Camera, which helped solidify the relationship and rivalry of Bugs and Elmer Fudd. Jones referred to such character mix-ups as a subconscious intellectual process, likening it to gradually evolving a kind of dress style that agrees with you. Jones and Maltese were incredibly adept at producing rivalry shorts, opposing the likes of Daffy, Porky and Pepe against bothersome opponents. In 1948, they produced a series of four Bugs Bunny shorts, each pitting him against gradually more more extravagant adversaries. Though there was always a push 
push to create new recurring characters, as was the case for these four cartoons, many were simply developed as one-offs, out of necessity for the given short. However, for monumental Looney Tunes short Hair Devil Hair, Jones knew he had to develop a special kind of character. While still facing off regularly against Elmer Fudd, over the last few years Bugs had found a new recurring foe. Officially debuting in 1945's Hair Trigger, after a number of earlier prototype appearances, Freeling's Yosemite Sam was a loud, obnoxious, furious, aggressive and, well, quite stupid gunslinger, often depicted as a cowboy, bandit or pirate. Maltese had written all of Sam's appearances, the majority of which alongside Ted Pierce, and all had been directed by Freeling. Having seen Bugs easily outwit and outsmart the incompetent Sam a number of times, Jones felt the need to develop a character that could actually pose a challenge and true threat, though of course still be defeated. To achieve this, Jones had to create someone who was the polar opposite of Sam. Calm, reserved, soft-spoken and fairly intellectual, though still clumsy in typical Looney Tunes fashion. In doing so, Jones concocted an extraterrestrial from Mars, hell bent on not only challenging bugs, but blowing up the entire planet Earth. Hair Devil Hair, released in 1948, marked the character's debut and was, in fact, the very first Warner's short to be set in outer space and centred on an alien being. Even though previous shorts had been set on fantastical worlds and featured otherworldly creatures, such as Clampett's 1938 cartoon Porky in Wacky Land. Hair Devil Hair was so radical and surrealist that Jones considered it one which turned the corner towards strange fantastical directions, influencing the kind of stories that he would tell thereafter. Though it is interesting to note that two years prior, Clampett's Kitty Cornered featured a prank where Sylvester and his cat friends, dressed as aliens, convinced Porky of an incoming invasion of men from Mars via a fake radio broadcast, a reference to Orson Welles' controversial 1938 War of the Worlds radio play. While Jones didn't handle this short, the collaborative nature of the Warner's teams meant that the directors helped brainstorm and workshop cartoons from other units. It's not a stretch to imagine that Jones had been inspired by, or perhaps even inspired the space age themes in Kitty Corner to begin with. That said, stories about Mars and men from Mars had been popular since the late 1800s, around which time observations and speculations had been made that the planet could quite possibly be teeming with intelligent life, or at least be suitable for human colonisation. The planet's ominous red hue also made it ripe for the picking, when it came to dramatic science fiction stories, such as H.G. Wells' 1898 novel The War of the Worlds and Edgar Rice Burroughs' highly popular John Carter of Mars series, published between 1912 and 1948. Similarly, space adventure series starring heroes like Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon were highly popular in pulp comics, film serials and radio dramas throughout the 30s and 40s. Though the space race, which would see the US go head to head with the Soviet Union, in a competition to put the first satellites and human beings in space wouldn't unfurl until the 50s and 60s, the mid to late 40s saw the beginnings of space exploration. Nazi Germany had experimented with long-range missiles during World War II, even breaking the Earth's atmosphere with a V-2 rocket in 1944, technically marking the first ever space flight. Throughout the middle 40s, the possibilities of space flight and space stationed communication satellites became hot topics of discussion in scientific journals and widespread media. Meanwhile, in 1946, the US government publicly experimented with rocket planes and seized German V-2 rockets, undertaking the first ever space research flight to experiment on cosmic radiation and the upper atmosphere. And the first ever photographs of Earth taken from space were captured by a V2 equipped with a camera. That same year, the first animals, fruit flies, were sent into space. Most interestingly, in 1947, the year before the release of Jones's Mars set cartoon, extensive carbon dioxide levels were found in the atmosphere of Mars by Dutch astronomer Gerard. Kuiper, again sparking public curiosity in life on Mars. Never had fiction felt so real, nor had the possibilities of space been so ingrained in the social zeitgeist, leaving the public with a feverish appetite for space-bound stories. It's obvious amongst the fervour, Jones found inspiration for Bugs' new antagonist. To design the character, Jones first looked to Roman mythology, aptly drawing inspiration from Mars the God of War, the Red Planet's name 
namesake. As a character hell-bent on waging interplanetary war, Jones wanted to design an outfit that was suitable wear for a god of war, saying his first step in creating the character was to draw the curiously tufted helmet worn by Mars, also incorporating the deity's metal skirt. His centurion helmet and skirt were coloured green, likely because it's a colour most associated with alien beings, and his helmet tuft notably looked quite shabby and more like an everyday brown household brush. Next, Jones crafted the character himself, settling on an ant-like design, simply because he believed ants to be scary, yet saw the humour in dressing one up in silly Roman garb, the perfect Looney Tunes juxtaposition. Jones noted, I put an ant black face and a couple of angry eyes inside his helmet and gave him no evident mouth. Because they were unable to rely just on the dialogue, the animation team had to, in his words, use body awareness to define him differently than the other characters and convey that he was speaking totally through his movements. The character animation on the Martian's body and then large eyes was so superb that Jones observed most audiences were rarely aware that he was drawn mouthless. Finally, Jones capped the Martian off with a red jumpsuit, yellow gloves and a pair of tennis shoes, despite not quite suiting the rest of his attire. But again, such was the lunacy of the Warner's characters, it worked perfectly. In fact, Jones used tennis shoes on his characters quite often, since as a child, the shoes made him believe he could jump higher, run faster, be invincible and even defy the laws of gravity, perfectly apt for a space-bound being. Jones found great physical comedy in them and such humour is never more evident that in his Martian character and his zany super high speed walk. The character wasn't given an official name straight away, with it remaining unspoken in the first short and the original model sheets only referring to him as Martian. However, Jones came to personally refer to the Martian as Antwerp, simply because he was designed to look like an ant and was a twerp. The short introduced the character's motives right off the bat with his very first line of dialogue. I'm going to blow up the earth. Introduced in this very short was also Marvin's weapon of choice, essentially a stick of dynamite, said in the character's trademark over-pronunciated technobabble. Oh goody, another uranium P-36 explosive space modulator. Of course, the Martian's voice was provided by the legendary Mel Blanc, who then voiced almost every major Warner's character. In Hair Devil Hair, the character has a slightly different voice than that which Blanc later settled upon. Also introduced Introduced in Hair Devil Hair was the Martian's faithful companion and sidekick, K9. While dressed exactly like the Martian, K9's design is rumoured to be a green version of Mickey Mouse's pet dog Pluto, coincidentally also named after the planet. While the short was popular, unlike many major Looney Tunes stars, Jones's new character wasn't an instant runaway success. While Yosemite Sam continued to face off against bugs up to three times annually in the following years, the Martian was nowhere to be seen, simply another one-shot character. That is, until four years later, when Jones decided to star him in his second short, 1952's The Hasty Hare, this time bringing him down to Earth to kidnap bugs to Mars. Here, the Martian remained nameless yet was given a title, Commander Flying Saucer X2. His outfit was much the same as well, though he was given white gloves and his helmet tuft was made sleeker and more distinguished. His eyes were also made a lot smaller and more emotive. Additionally, Mel Blanc's voice for the character came into its own. Jones must have taken a liking to his Martian commander, giving him the spotlight again the following year in Duck Dodgers in the 24th and a half century, the only Golden Age Martian short not to star bugs. The short was one of many classic Daffy Duck, Porky Pig team-ups that Jones developed to spoof popular media and was a send-up of radio space drama Buck Rogers in the 25th century, which ran throughout the 1930s and 1940s, even spawning a 1939 film serial and subsequent television series in the early 1950s. While Daffy and Porky appeared in character as Duck Dodgers and his sidekick, the Martian appeared essentially as himself, fighting against Dodgers for declaration of Planet X. Here he saw no design or personality modifications, but the popularity of the short, which was later named the fourth greatest cartoon of all time by animation industry experts, made him a fairly well-known recurring Looney Tunes character. However, Jones later said that, 
at the time, audiences liked it, but they liked just about everything we did. It wasn't a case of people giving the cartoon a standing ovation in theatres and demanding to see it again. As such, it would be another five years before The Martian appeared on screens again. In 1958, Hairway to the Stars, another space set Bugs adventure. In one of Jones's greatest shorts, he is once again seen scheming to blow up the Earth, this time finally revealing the motives behind his actions. Oh, uh, I'm going to blow it up. It obstructs my view of Venus. This short also reveals that the Martian is either immortal or has an incredibly long lifespan. At last, after 2,000 years of work, the Illudium Q36 Explosive Space Modulator. While the Martian's design remained mostly the same here, he was strangely given a new colour scheme, with an olive green armour and a bright green jumpsuit. Again, the Martian disappeared for another five years, re-emerging in 1963's Man as a Mars Hare, where he appeared once again in the same modified design, with his armour taking on more of a brown colour. With the emergence of television meaning less people were going to cinemas and cinema chains were less willing to pay for cartoons, Warner Brothers Cartoon Studio closed the following year. Animation was outsourced to various independent animation houses and produced on cheap budgets, with a limited animation style until 1969. As such, Jones directed only a few more Warner's shorts before opening his own production company where he began producing Tom and Jerry cartoons for MGM and television specials such as the 1966 classic How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Due to this, Mad as a Mars Hare marked the Martian's final Golden Age appearance. MGM eventually absorbed Jones's company in 1964 before closing completely in 1970. He formed yet another Another company, Chuck Jones Enterprises, through which he produced a number of Saturday morning TV series for ABC and television specials for CBS. Jones, however, returned to Warner Brothers Animation in 1976 to produce and direct television specials and package features following the success of The Bugs Bunny Show, which repackaged classic shorts for television syndication, and additionally featured short bridging sequences of new animation, notably including a series of Tang commercials starring Marvin. In the early 1970s, filmmaker George Lucas began developing a highly ambitious space adventure film that would go on to change the face of cinema. 1977's Star Wars. Lucas has cited Duck Dodgers as one of the film's key inspirations, alongside of course Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon and a plethora of others. Jones recalled, Lucas said that he saw Duck Dodgers the year that it came out when he was 8 years old and it impressed him so much he decided he wanted to make movies. And animation historian Jim Caucus proclaims that Lucas made arrangements for theatres to screen Duck Dodgers prior to the film whenever possible. Steven Spielberg, in an interview for 2000 Chuck Jones' documentary Extremes and Inbetweens, inferred, likely in jest, that Lucas had loved The Martian so much that the entire costume design for Darth Vader came from him. In a strange twist of fate, the immense popularity of Lucas's Star Wars had a substantially fortuitous effect on the Looney Martian. Star Wars was such a phenomenon that once again the world became infatuated with space adventures. Star Wars collector and author Stephen J. Sansweet notes that the film jump-started the slow-growing licensing business and was responsible for the now taken-for-granted licensing of major movies, for products ranging from novels and trading cards to toys and clothing. With over 42 million action figures sold within the first year of release and merchandising outgrossing the film itself. Not only did Star Wars merch sell like gangbusters, but as a result anything and everything space did too. Action figures of spacemen, astronauts and aliens flooded the market and tons of space adventure series and movies began springing up. The marketing team at Warner's was quick to realise and firstly aired Bugs Bunny in Space on CBS mere months after Star Wars' release. A television special repackaging all of the Marvin shorts thus far, with exception of Hair Devil Hair. It was so hastily thrown together in fact that it remains the only Looney Tunes special to feature no newly animated segments. In a plan to capitalise on the merchandising craze, Warners also began featuring the character in merchandise and extended media. Some of the earliest to feature the character actually used Jones's original name Antwerp, as seen in various documentation from the era. Most notably, the name Antwerp was used in 
in various stage productions, including a live version of Bugs Bunny in Space, which actually featured a song recorded by Mel Blanc titled My Name is Antwerp. However, it seems the studio wanted something catchier and more in line with other Looney Tunes for more official media, and thus debuted a brand new name in 1979 package feature The Bugs Bunny Roadrunner Movie, Marvin Martian. The the wasn't added until later, possibly for legal reasons. While many suggest that the name was a concoction of the studio's marketing department, many historians attest that it could only have come from Jones's imagination. In fact, some sources have even quoted Jones as saying he named the character Marvin because I never knew anyone named Marvin who did anything worthwhile. The film featured new animation produced and directed by Jones, which bookended a selection of his best shorts, including two starring Marvin, Hairway to the Stars and Duck Dodgers. The film and TV special reintroduced the character to the new generation and with marketing to back it up, helped him become a beloved character. With George Lucas preparing to release his first Star Wars sequel, The Empire Strikes Back, in 1980, a new Duck Dodgers short was thrown into production. Jim Corcus notes that Lucas had it commissioned to run alongside Empire, while fellow animation historian Jerry Beck suggests that Warners did so of their own accord, in an attempt to piggyback on the sequel's presumed success. With Warners animation in such a state of disarray, Jones had to pull much of his old team back together, tasking Maltese to write the short. Though not fully impressed with the final script, rewrote it himself. Duck Dodgers and the Return of the 24th and a Half Century, released in 1980 as part of NBC TV's Daffy Duck's Thanks for Giving special, instead of theatrically as planned. Caucus notes that the short wasn't completed in time to run alongside Star Wars, and thus the TV special, which sees Daffy attempting to convince Warner's execs to make a Duck Dodgers sequel, was created solely to recoup costs. Beck, however, insists that the short must have been screened alongside the film at some point, considering it was in contention for an Academy Award nomination. While Marvin only appears in the short very briefly in his classic green and red design, Maltese's storyboard for his original version showed that he originally had a pretty substantial role. Though with major set pieces and gags lifted directly from the original short, it's not hard to see why Jones gave it the veto. The final short did, however, give Marvin one of his most memorable moments, allowing him to deliver his own variant on the classic Looney sign-off. In that same year's CBS TV special Bugs Bunny's Bustin' Out All Over, Marvin made another appearance in a brand new cartoon, Spaced Out Bunny. The short, directed as always by Jones, saw a new take on the Bugs kidnapping formula and once again saw him in his classic attire and colour scheme, though appearing for the first time in limited animation. Despite Marvin's newfound popularity, he continued to go underutilised for the next decade. In Disney's 1988 film Who Framed Roger Rabbit, he featured in a a very short Blink and You'll Miss It cameo, and appeared in only one more Looney Tunes television special, 1991's Bugs Bunny's Lunar Tunes, featuring brand new animation bookending classic shorts. In the new segments where Marvin appears in his classic design, he once again kidnaps Bugs, taking him to intergalactic court on charges of casting aliens in a negative light. Bugs is forced to defend the Earth or see it face an apocalyptic punishment. Throughout the courtroom drama, as evidence, Marvin shows shows clips from Hair Devil Hair and Duck Dodgers. In the early 1990s, through focus group studies, Warners found that Marvin was a particularly exciting character for younger generations, and began to ramp up his appearances in merchandise and marketing, which included regular appearances in the Looney Tunes comic books. He additionally continued to appear sporadically in television guest appearances throughout the decade. In Tiny Toon Adventures, he predominantly appeared in the 1991 Duck Dodgers Jr. segment, where he and his young protege, Marsha the Martian, face off against Daffy and Plucky Duck. And in a 1992 episode of Tasmania, The Man from Mars, another spoof of the 1938 War of the Worlds broadcast, where Tasmanian Devil mistakes Marvin for a malicious invader. He additionally appeared in brief cameo appearances in a 1993 episode of Animaniacs, the 1998 Pinky and the Brain Animaniacs crossover, Star Warners, a Star Wars parody, in a 1999 episode of The Sylvester and Tweety Mysteries and its 2000 spin-off film, Tweety's High Flying Adventure. 
He additionally cameoed in two 1990s Looney Tunes revival shorts, 1995's Another Froggy Evening starring Michigan J. Frog, which sees Marvin abducting the character and singing a duet with him, and 1996's Superior Duck starring Daffy, where he once again disintegrates him after he lands on his spaceship. However, his most important appearance in the 1990s came in 1996 theatrical film Space Jam, a live-action animation hybrid which saw the Looney Tunes teaming up with basketball superstar Michael Jordan to save the Earth against alien invaders. Marvin only appeared briefly as the referee of the Tune Squad v Monstars basketball match, in a role that many theorise as meant to show his impartiality as both a tune and an alien. Interestingly, Marvin's DNA is deeply embedded in Space Jam, and not just because it's a space film. In fact, the idea for it spawned directly from a space set 1993 Nike Air Jordan commercial starring Marvin, Bugs and Jordan. The film itself was also enormously important in Marvin's current popularity. A moderate critical success maligned by some loony fans and even Chuck Jones, but a box office smash, Space Jam spawned an enormously lucrative merchandise campaign, with Marvin as the easily exploitable space tune at the forefront. 90s kids gravitated towards the merch, especially that featuring Marvin, with Marvin the Martian t-shirts becoming a staple of youth wear throughout the latter half of the decade. A number of VHS collections were also released, collecting the classic Marvin shorts for the new generation. Despite having such a small role in the film, Marvin became its star by way of merchandising, solidifying him as the iconic fan favourite Looney Tune that he is today, certifying him a staple of the lineup. Thanks to his newfound popularity, Marvin was given his first ever headline role in 1997's Marvin the Martian in the Third Dimension, designed specifically for a theme park experience with 4D effects. It was the first Warner cartoon to be produced in 3D animation, though combined with traditional animation, and was the first ever 3D animation produced with a stereoscopic 3D presentation to be viewed with 3D glasses. The attraction could be found at Warner Brothers Movie Worlds in Australia and Germany, Drayton Manor theme park in England, Six Flags Great America in the USA, and in numerous Warner Brothers Studio stores. Another prominent film role came in 2003's live action animation hybrid Looney Tunes Back in Action. In it, Marvin appeared as one of its main villains, fighting against Bugs and Daffy as Duck Dodgers in a Star Wars inspired sequence. Unfortunately, though, the film was a critical and financial flop. That year, NASA would notably use an image of Marvin on the launch pad patch and the body of the Marvin. Mars Spirit Rover, sent to explore Mars's landscape between 2004 and 2010, truly solidifying his impact on and importance in popular culture. Also worth noting, Spirit's twin rover, Opportunity, featured a depiction of Duck Dodgers on its patch. Throughout the 2000s, Marvin again appeared in a number of television series. Most prominently, he was a main antagonist of the 2003 Duck Dodgers series, taking the role of Commander X2 of the Martian military and servant of the Martian Queen. He was presented in his classic Roman attire, but without a jumpsuit. He also appeared in a couple of the series' mini shorts alongside K9. In 2002 Baby Looney Tunes episode War of the Weirds, Marvin appeared in a babyfied design, and in 2000 2007 Lunatics Unleashed episode It Came From Outer Space, his descendant Melvin the Martian, also General of the Martian Army, vows to blow up the planet Acmetropolis, the home of the Lunatics, ancestors of the Looney Tunes. Throughout the 2000s, Marvin also appeared up to his usual hijinks in a number of webtoons. In 2006's Bar Humduck, a Looney Tunes Christmas, a director home media retelling of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, he appeared as a poor shopping mall assistant, working for the Scrooge-like Daffy, longing to be home for the holidays. And in 2015's direct-to-home media movie Rabbit's Run, he appeared in a fairly substantial role, threatening to turn the Earth invisible. Just like old times, he is of course outsmarted by Bugs and Co. In 2008, Warner Brothers announced a live-action CG animated Marvin the Martian movie was in production and would hit cinemas in 2011. The movie was set to see Marvin, voiced by Mike Myers, attempting to destroy the Earth at Christmas time, with Santa Claus, played by Christopher Lee, foiling his plans by wrapping him up as a Christmas gift. The film quietly fell into production hell and is clearly cancelled, despite the fact that no official statement from Warner Brothers was ever made on its fate. However, in 2012, test footage 
footage from the film leaked online, giving us an idea of what we could have expected. In more recent years, Marvin has had recurring roles in the two most current Looney series. In 2011's The Looney Tune Show, he was presented as an ex-high school acquaintance of Daffy's, a foreign exchange student from Mars, hell-bent on destroying the Earth since graduation. In the series, he underwent his first major redesign by artist Jessica Borutsky, though by simply being slightly stylized, his redesign wasn't as drastic as other characters. Likewise, in 2015's New Looney Tunes, originally called Wabbit, where most characters took on a Clampet-esque screwball design, Marvin remained mostly untouched. In 2017, Marvin notably featured in a one-shot DC Comics crossover issue alongside Martian Manhunter. In a new design by Aaron Lepresti, Marvin took on a more realistic look in line with the DC Comics style, appearing in an armour which appears to have been heavily influenced by that of the classic Romans. Marvin will next appear in a Looney Tunes cartoons debuting in 2020 on the upcoming HBO Max streaming service. The series will present scores of new 1-6 to six minute shorts heavily inspired by the classic cartoons. Each will feature writing and animation by different artists, allowing different personality and style to come through. Though we haven't seen any officially released look at Marvin in the series just yet, some leaked promo art, not shown here for legal reasons, shows him with large eyes and yellow gloves as a throwback to his first appearance. It's also very likely we'll see changing designs throughout the series. It's also likely he'll appear in upcoming HBO Max series Tuned Out, a new live action animation project produced by Roger Rabbit director Robert Zemeckis, as well as in 2021's Space Jam 2 starring LeBron James. Marvin the Martian is quite clearly one of the strangest oddities in the Looney Tunes canon. Unlike many others, he managed to escape the dreaded cartoon purgatory where he was originally designated a spot, going from one-off character to cult icon. Though still being heavily underutilized in film and television properties, the character continues to live on as a merchandising behemoth, even appearing in a number of recent television commercials. He's certainly seen quite the journey, and I'd like to see him take the lead in future properties. But how about you guys out there? I want to know, would you like to see more of Marvin in the future? What do you think he belongs on the sidelines? Also, don't forget to let me know your own personal favourite Marvin the Martian appearances. For me, it's got to be Dark Dodgers. But as a kid of the 90s who did in fact own a Marvin the Martian t-shirt, I do have a very big soft spot for Space Jam. Fire away in the comments below and let me know your thoughts. If this is your first time viewing one of my videos and you'd like to see more like it in the future, then please don't forget to hit that big old subscribe button up on your screen, as well as that like button down below for that little extra support. Also, don't forget to check me out on social media, and please consider supporting me over on Patreon. Thanks for watching, and have a fantastic day.